Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Nick Van Acker, educator at the MSU Museum. Welcome to another one of our fossil fun uh, events that we're doing this fall uh, in collaboration with the MSU Museum Dinosaur Dash and National Fossil Day. Um, we're joined again by Dr. Janita Brandt, um, and we're going to do something a little more loosey-goosey today. Um, we're doing our fossil ID. So ordinarily uh, at uh, its National Fossil Day event, people would be able to bring in real fossils. They could be identified by a paleontologist, of course, uh, with us not doing an in-person event and also having a lot of regulations about what we can and can't touch right now. Um, bringing in real fossils to have be passed around between people wasn't the best idea. So we instead set up an email um, where people could send us pic uh, pictures of fossils that they had at home. And we got a couple of different responses from people. So we're gonna go through those. Um, this is the first time that Dr. Brandt is going to be seeing them, so we'll be going kind of off the cuff, testing her knowledge, um, but we'll see if we can stop her. No off. script. We're off script, yes. <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able We're to. off, no script, the spontaneous, yeah. totally, yeah. Yeah, so we can start off with the first one, and some of these fossils I've, I've seen before, and I have an idea what they are, and some of them I have no idea, so I'm excited to, to learn right along with everybody else. But I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, let's see. OK, share. And can you see that, Danita? It says you're screen sharing. And I see, oh, there it is. It just popped in. Perfect. All right. Um, so petrified wood. Petrified wood? <laughs> right off the Next. bat. Got it easy. Um, well, OK. So so let me just let me just explain my thought process okay and, and maybe it's not i mean i'm looking at a picture and what i see it is um longer than it is wide uh and there seems to be a a fabric some sort of orientation you know, something's lined up a texture uh, along the long axis okay um, not quite layers, but this texture. I see two or three colors. There's a kind of light, very light brown, I guess, not very good at colors. And then white and then darker gray and black streaks that are along that long axis. Um, it seems to be made of all the same thing, like there aren't different parts. It's this piece that's pretty much the same throughout its, its length. Uh, so unlike, say, a Petoskey stone coral that we would look for different hexagons for the corals, this is, this is all one thing, whatever it is, it's one thing. Um, okay. So it's not, and I, and I don't see, I wouldn't describe this as shell material, but I, I would really have to look at it in, in person to make sure that isn't like shell material flaking off. Um, I don't see compartments, it's all one thing. Um, so we can rule out anything that's like a colonial organism. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't see, oh, symmetry is something we look for. Uh, it's, it's this, it's the cylinder. So it's got the symmetry of a cylinder. It's not got pentagonal symmetry, which might point to echinoderms and it's, yeah, it's this thing. All right. Uh, what else? Symmetry, color is something obvious. Color doesn't always tell us something diagnostic. Color can be very misleading. So that's kind of one of the last things we want to use to make an identification on. Um, I would bet it's not real heavy. Uh, it's light color and the way it's broken uh, I'm, I'm guessing that it's made out of quartz or a form of quartz like chert or, or flint. Quartz uh, is a mineral that commonly replaces um, uh, tissue in fossil plants, especially wood. 
Now it can also replace fossil shells in some circumstances. But it's a, it's a common way that wood is, is uh, fossilized. So the, the texture, the overall shape, it's all one thing. Uh, it's probably been replaced by quartz. Uh, that's where my assessment of fossil wood comes from. Now, to be certain, we'd like to take it and slice a piece off so, uh, across the, the long axis uh, and uh, grind it down and make a thin section and put it under the microscope. And we might be able to see the uh, cells in in the wood, if, if, if that is indeed woody tissue. So that would be fun. That's um, my, based on this two-dimensional representation, that's my assessment. And that's how, why people get degrees in paleontology, because you can get all of that out of the picture <laughs> compared, compared yes, to some of the yes, yes. <laughs> No, that's, Now, yeah. it would be, the other, other information we use in making an identification is like, where did you find it? And of course, where you found it doesn't mean that's where it lived or even where it died and got buried. In Michigan, a lot of the rocks in our backyard, they were formed uh, somewhere completely away from here and got a ride in the glaciers and got deposited in our backyard. So knowing where it's from uh, could give me clues as to uh, like how old it is, like if, if I know the geology of the area, what's, what's the local bedrock. Uh, around here, our local bedrock will buy Grand Ledge, it's, it's Pennsylvanian, and so we would look for fossil plants. Uh, but in other parts of Michigan, the bedrock is Devonian, and that's where we get our Petoskey stone corals from. Um, yeah, this, I just said this is fossil wood, and I said something about fossil plants coming from Grand Ledge. This does not look like Grand Ledge mm -hmm. uh, plant material. Uh, this is not a fern. This is, I, if, if I'm correct, it is a woody plant. And you don't get that kind of plant uh, until much later in, or yeah, in, uh, after uh, the ferns of Grand Ledge. So geologically, I would, this is really guessing now, but, um, this is geologically a lot younger than our local bedrock. So I would hazard a guess that if this was found in Michigan, it was transported here from mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, and so. this one is actually one of mine that I, that I have uh -huh. that I got from my grandfather. And I, I knew that it was petrified wood. I assumed it was petrified wood, but uh -huh. um, I don't know where it came from. I know he was a rock hound. He, he collected yeah. a lot of stuff come from almost anywhere. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's petrified wood. I learned um, uh, in taking family vacations, there's a, like a state park in Alabama that's known for petrified wood. Oh, really? So that's a place, you know, maybe that came from Alabama. Yeah, it could be. And he he yeah, traveled extensively all over the place. So it could be from almost anywhere. And now... Oh, by the way, how, how large is that? Oh, I can actually just grab it. <laughs> uh, grab it out of your Ordovician diorama. Grab it out of the, the seafloor there. That oh, large. that is a, a good size. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's about like that. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Let's see. I'm having some issues with my screen sharing. Oh, good old Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are we able to go through, or is this the only one? Here, I will. Pull up another one and see if this is going to let us scroll through. I was hoping I was just going to be able to tap the arrows and scroll through the pictures, but it's not wanting to let me do that for whatever reason. That's an opossum. <laughs> <laughs> that one's a living animal. Let's test your living <laughs> skills now. All right. 
There we go. Okay, so we can we can use this. So this is another one that we have that we had submitted to us. Um, and this person said that they thought it might belong to a squid, but they weren't sure. So we've got a couple of pictures here. Uh, it looks like there's a, a black bit in the middle and then an orange ring around the outside, if you can see those. Oh. <laughs> I I have no idea why why anyone why would they say squid? I just I'm 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 flummoxed. I'm looking at this thinking. Um, I'm not even sure it's a rock. <laughs> All right, so it seems to be spherical. Okay, it is a dark color. If we look at the the view that shows the outside of it, the other view. That one. Yeah. Okay. That, that that's a good one. So so we have it's kind of spherical. And it's like about an inch or an inch and a half in diameter. Yeah. I mean that looks like basalt. You know, <laughs> just as far as black and 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 rough in texture, but it does have this interesting structure on the inside. Let's go to the other view where it's sitting there with the with the broken side. Yeah. So there's this outer ring, and then there's an inner thing, and then there's the thing in the middle. All right, the outer edge has an orange color, which suggests that the black material that's encasing this uh, does have iron minerals in it. And that's basically rusty oxidized iron minerals forming this, this outer um, layer. Um, and then I really can't see anything diagnostic except, so, so we have a, a term to describe um, uh, rocks that, that form in this kind of concentric uh, way and you break them open and they have this layered structure and there's something on the inside. Um, uh, we call them concretions. That's just a, a name that describes a whole category of, of rocks that form by layers accreting around a central thing, a nucleus. And a lot of times, uh, I mean, it's uh, the nucleus could be uh, a fossil. Um, the famous Mazan Creek concretions of Northern Illinois. Um, they're iron concretions. So they have this, this iron stained exterior and you break them open and, and there are fossil ferns and, and, and other fossils that were the nucleus that um, created as, as the animal or plant decayed, that created uh, a miniature a geochemical environment around the decaying organic matter that uh, cause the, the minerals to cement the concretion to form. Now, this is a really unusual, I mean, it's cool because it's so round, it's so spherical. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but um, um, I can't, I mean, so what I see is this dark, almost oval, well, it almost, Almost looks like Nick a leaflet that I was showing you earlier from uh, yeah from a Grand Ledge fern like a single leaflet. I'm I'm just totally flummoxed. I would love to know why the finder thought squid of of, of all things to pick in the world. <laughs> why squid? I'm I'm not seeing where the squid part comes in. You know, first of all, squids are pretty unusual as fossils yeah. uh, because they they don't have hard parts. Now in the in the Mesozoic and Paleozoic, squid relatives had external shells, and, and those are the ammonites, which are very popular like in, in rock shops and they're popular with jewelry, these nice coiled shells that are commonly sliced and polished. Um, so fossil squids are usually the um, the hard shell. Yeah. Uh, so cuttlefish, modern squids, uh, a, a fossil uh, modern squid would be 
a rare and exceptional fossil because it would have to basically be the, the imprint mm -hmm. of, of the animal. So I am flummox. I would say it's an ironstone concretion from what I can see. Nick, can, can you uh, give me the screen share just so I could put up the, yeah, for sure. the, the fern, fern leaf? And again, it would be helpful. Okay, so here, this is a fossil fern from Grand Ledge. And what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking I'm seeing is a single leaf, it's called leaflet from a fern that might be the nucleus of, of that fossil. And again, it would be helpful to know where, where was this object found. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's, it's, it's a very curious, thing yeah. <laughs> thing it's very yeah. curious yeah. Object. Yeah. I'm not entirely yeah. sure right it could it could be industrial slag mm -hmm. um, that that rough texture to the outside a dark rough um, yeah iron iron rich slag and it, oh, we have so much you know uh, old old factories old industries that you know uh, might not the buildings might not be there anymore, but some of the, the I don't want to say waste, but materials that were byproducts of industry left behind. So yeah, that's a, that's a poser. That's a poser. But I, I'd be fat because be, behind you is, is a, a squid from the Paleozoic, a squid that had the long shell. So I'm just like, you know what? I, I'm so curious as to From as to modern squids. The only thing I can think is maybe they saw the black bit and thought it was a fossilized eye, which of course we could talk about that. But eyes would that not would be, be fossilized, really? Um, or it could be maybe the amazing. Eye, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but that's that's mm -hmm. all I have. So I love that the person. It's so it's a really cool rock. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's really, really cool. cool. It's really interesting. And it's, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just cool in itself. So. And let's see. Okay. So this person also sent in a couple. And obviously, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm fairly certain this one is. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you see that one? It takes, it seems to take a moment or two before it pops in. Okay, it's not there yet, but, oh, yes, yeah, so yeah, okay, oh, okay. Ooh, very nice, very nice. Again, locality data would help nail it down, but, uh, oh yes, 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 okay, okay. So, we're looking at uh, an elongate cylindrical fossil. Uh, it, it's significant. It's really nice they, they sent two views. There seems to be segmentation, the kind of ribs going along the, the long axis. And then there are uh, fine lines running parallel to the long axis and that kind of is the, what we would call this, the ornamentation. But you look at the end, this near end, and it's featureless. Mm -hmm. It's basically just mud. So we had this cylindrical object and whatever was in the center isn't there or wasn't there, maybe it was empty, but it filled with mud. And we are looking at um, basically uh, it, the um, the outside. Oh, the other the other thing about this this object, uh, the color is basically um, black, dark gray, black, and except where it's kind of flaked off. Okay, um, so. There are two things that I, I would give people partial credit for one and, and full credit for the other. Um, usually, and again, knowing where it's from, that, that, would, that would really um, 
help nail this down, but <clears throat> there are two things it could be. It could be uh, a portion of that long cephalopod that's behind your shoulder there, uh, because that would be kind of a similar thing where you have the, the shell is not preserved, but the shell filled with mud and, and cephalopods have, have chambers, have segmentation, but this is not a cephalopod. And okay, so what is it? Uh, it's a, oh, I'm gonna have to look up the, the part of the plant. It's part of a plant from the coal age, from the Pennsylvanian. Uh, and I, I guess it's the stem, is it the stem? Calamites, I could, I can come up with the genus name. Oh yeah, okay. So think of, think of, of um, what do we call them? What do we call them? Horsetails? Oh yeah. The reeds, those, those plants that uh, grow in swampy places and they're, they're kind of uh, uh, this in segments and you pull them apart anyway. Yeah, so uh, Calamites, is an extinct uh, re relative of horsetails. Actually, this uh, Wikipedia is telling me it's closely related. So um, the black in, in sedimentary rocks, black color is commonly uh, uh, a reflection of carbon content. Think, think about coal. Coal, which is black, 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 and and coal, which is basically compressed plant material. Um, the fern leaflets I showed earlier were were black, were darker in this in this gray mud. So the uh, the color is giving us a clue to um, the, what we're looking at, a plant, and then. If you think about horsetails and how they are cylinders and they have this prominent um, uh, uh, longitudinal texture to their stems, you know, these, these lines running down the long axis, and they are also segmented. So this is a stem of a, a, a coal swamp age, Pennsylvanian period age, horsetail. That's so cool. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but trees didn't exist at that the point that this plant was alive, right? Well, what do you mean by tree? Today. Yeah. So the, the large, the, <clears throat> the large, the, the tree sized plants were called tree ferns because <laughs> they were as large as trees, but they they were not the um, they weren't they certainly weren't the uh, angiosperms the deciduous trees that we have today. Now gymnosperms got their start uh, back in the Pennsylvania as well, but but this other group called tree ferns were were the dominant plants of of that time. So that's a wonderful example of calamites. Oh yeah, uh, it's yeah. very nice, very nice. So again, it, um, if you want to make a paleontologist happy, <clears throat> you make a label and you put the name on it and you put where you found it and you put the collector's name. Uh, and if it's really, really nice, you donate it to your local natural history museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you put it in a prominent place in your home and show it off proudly and then put it in your will to donate to the Natural History Museum. That's right, that's right. It's part of your estate, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I've never, um, I don't think I've ever seen a, a Calamites unless we have fossils of them on display at the museum, which I don't I don't recall. I know there's pieces of them, but. Ah, uh, we might, but that's that's a really nice one. It's, yeah. it's hella, because, and think of it, plants, they, you usually, you know, they get, they get squished. Right, and but that got filled in with the mud, and the mud solidified, so it kept its three D shape. So that's that's a really nice example. <clears throat> and so this person, it looks like they have a couple more. There's this one that we've got pictures from a couple okay. of angles. Oh, great! 
and they said maybe it was a horn coral and maybe they'd be right and okay so let's talk about this um first of all if you find a fossil in your backyard in michigan I, my rule of thumb is nine times out of 10, it's gonna be a coral. And that's because Michigan was covered by a shallow tropical ocean for most of its history. And uh, corals were abundant in that shallow sea. So they were abundant. The sea covered all of Michigan. Um, and corals are, are tough. They're, they're made of calcium carbonate, the minerals calcite and they have a very sturdy um, structure. The, the animal itself is the fleshy soft parts as we call them in paleontology. I, imagine a polyp, um, like a sea anemone. Imagine a polyp uh, with tentacles that was situated uh, in this view, the top of the coral. That, that's kind of what we're looking at where, where that indentation is that the polyp would have set there and uh, and so that's the up direction in this coral. Um, and then, would, is there another view of, yeah, of this? A couple of them. And I actually just remembered, I brought a couple of horn corals home from the museum for a virtual program that we're doing later. So if you do wanna, I can, I can pull one out in orientation if you're interested, but. Yeah, so what we can see, and, and this is not, oh, whoa. That's the, that's is this it. the same guy? Too forward. Yeah, that's the the last one that they've got. Okay. Yeah, uh, and and you see, we can kind of see how it grew. Uh, right now, the the bottom, and and it looks like it's, it doesn't have the whole coral. It's broken off. So so the bottom is to to the lower right here, and it kind of grew in these in these almost rings, a stage that made kind of a ring, and then a, another uh, growth period. So yeah, and that's a very interesting texture looking into the um, into where the polyp sat. Yeah. Uh, in other corals, you could see um, a septa, the the walls that divided the um, the living chamber. This does not have. I mean, this has this very different texture to it. So it's it's a species I'm not familiar with. But uh, yeah, the, but there were uh, lots of different kinds of corals in, in our ancient Michigan shallow seas. They, they, they love they loved the environment. They oh, really flourished. Well, you can see how I guess this is a little bit different period than, than coral reef necessarily. But yeah, there's lots of diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, there's just one more from, from this person. But yeah, they, they sent in a bunch of great fossils. Yeah, I, I appreciate the scale. I appreciate the different uh, orientations to look at. Yeah. So this is, looks like the same one. Okay. Let's see. And I, I have a- All right, two views of this one. And then that's the, the next one. I wasn't sure how many photos there were. So it looks like there's three views. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, another coral. Another coral. The it's interesting. You don't always get the the kind of almost cabbage-like layering, but that is characteristic of some corals. Some some look more like maybe the ones you have, Nick, that look more like just the smoother exterior, more like a horn, more like a, a, a horn off of a steer or something. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so this and actually, can can we look at? The other views of this one. Yeah. Um, take the, the one that's got kind of the scallops on it, like you're talking about, like the cabbage, cabbaginess. Um, yeah. That one already. Um, okay. This. Hmm, 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 hmm. Let's, let's look at the other one. Let's look at the, are there only two pictures of this one? Yeah. And then there's one more. It's taking a second to load that one. All right. All right, that's more like our first guy. But then these last two. Um, tum -tum. 
Coral's a safe bet, but it looks like there's some interesting texture on this one. So I'm wondering if this one is actually a stromatoporoid, mm. which is its own group. It's not a coral, it's not a sponge, but if you took a coral and a sponge and crossed them, I mean, it's kind of like what stromatoporoids are. So they're colonial um, and they live in tropical marine environments uh, and they're fairly common in Michigan's uh, Paleozoic rocks, especially Devonian rocks. So it suggests it's colonial, perhaps. Like this is not a, a single uh, horn corals are individual corals. Mm -hmm. Like that first one we were looking at, that was one individual. But if this is a stromatoporoid, this is a colony of a lot of uh, millimeter sized um, organisms living in. If, if I'm looking at this correctly and I see all this little bumpiness that those could be um, the, the compartments that the individuals were living in. So th this one's a little bit, it, it might not be a, a horn coral, it might be a stromatoporoid. Ooh, that's super neat. No, and it's so cool to know that there's there's differences. And I mean, are there, I know a lot of corals nowadays are colonial like that too. Are there still individual corals that are just like one organism? Yes, right. yes. And those tend to be interesting. We, we think of reef corals and those tend to be um, the colonial ones of in, in modern corals and, you know, reefs and they're all living, you know, stacked together. Uh, but corals, there are corals that live in very cold and very deep waters today. And those tend to be just these individual, large individual corals. So it's, it's, it's kind of neat that they, they occupy very different um, uh, environments and, and niches. So the, the cold, deep corals, it's like, it's anti-intuitive because we think of a scene like behind you, yeah. Nick, in the diorama of the shallow tropical sea, yeah, where it's nice and warm. So exist all sorts of places. That's super interesting. And then um, this one got sent in um, by somebody who sent it from their daughter, um, who I, I'm not sure what age they said their daughter was, but she was younger, I know, um, who and said in the circle they thought there was a fossil, but they aren't sure. Um, that it wasn't sure if they thought it was a uh, child's imagination or actually. yeah can we possibly can you make that as big as we can get it yes. I'm gonna take it a second to catch up I think mm -hmm. okay so this is inside the circle Oh, hey, yeah, that I like that magnification. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, let's back down in the magnification for a moment so we could just describe what we're looking at. Okay, um, the rock appears to be made of very, very fine grain material like mud. Maybe. Uh, so it's, and it's dark in color suggesting, um, you know, some carbon. Um, but that suggests a sedimentary environment. We're pretty sure we're looking at a sedimentary rock. It has, it has broken on this flat surface. Um, so something like shale or, or siltstone maybe. Um, it's dark in color, fine grain. Now, I mean, that, that circle, it's around a, a difference in texture. You, you can see that there's a little bit of texture there. So it's not just totally random. It's not looking at a blank wall and seeing something. Um, okay, now it turned into an ammonite. Yeah. <laughs> And I moved on to the last one by accident. I meant to look at the other view for this. Nope. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so you know, it's it's not like someone threw just the 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 circle down on the rock randomly. 
no, the, the, the area inside there seems to be something with some texture. Now, when we zoomed in, that didn't really help. <laughs> it didn't really reveal anything. So um, I don't see anything obvious. If it's, if there's something there, it maybe it's the imprint of something. I mean, I, you know, I got kind of excited because imagine a trilobite just imprinted. There, there seems to be, if, if you squint, uh, oh, can, can I, can you, sh can I share? Can I, I'd like, I'd like to like move my cursor on here um, or. Send you the picture, maybe, or I know. Oh well, no, that's 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 probably yeah. trying to do too much. Anyway, so there's some texture there that suggests there could, there might have been something. Maybe it's maybe it's an impression of something. There's not enough. There's not enough to make any definitive um, identification, but. There's enough to say, wow, what a good eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is different. That is different. And what I would want, what I would encourage this budding paleontologist to do is just go out and, and look and look and look and look and find different fossils. And, and you train your eye on, on things to key in. So I can't identify what that might be, but um, you know, it's it's typical of someone with young eyes <laughs> who could pick out that 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 part of the rock was different, had that different texture, and might be something. So, so thank you for that contribution. Yeah, no, and that's like you said. I mean, paleontology is all about looking for what's different in the rocks, right? You're looking for something that's not just a regular rock; it's something that used to be alive. Yeah. And so, our, and uh, what's left over for something that used to be alive, and so yeah, out those details is so important. Yeah. So the and last one that see, we have. Oh, sorry. No, just seeing seeing a lot of fossils and just yeah. just training your eye and training your brain. Yeah. yeah. The last one we have, I accidentally jumped ahead to, but it is a really cool one. Um, <laughs> so this one was uh, sent in by uh, somebody who found stuff on our website. Um, they said that they know it's an ammonite or they're, they're pretty confident it's an ammonite. Um, it was found by a family friend in a quarry in Texas. Oh, it, you know, I wish I had said that before you told me. <laughs> and now it's gonna sound like, oh yeah. Um, All right. Yeah, it's an ammonite, and I would have guessed Texas, and this is why. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there more information? Oh, no, that was, they were just hoping that you could give them any more information than that they knew. Yeah, and I am not an ammonite expert, but, um, you know, we've got the, the internet. Now, why, how did I know it was Texas? Ammonites, all right, these are, these are cephalopods, these are, uh, distant relatives of, of modern squid and octopus. They were very abundant during the Mesozoic era. At the same time dinosaurs were flourishing on land, these guys were just owning the oceans. Um, and uh, they got very large. Oh, I like that. Yeah, this is a pretty good size one. Yeah. Um, ooh, all these different views. Yes, yes. So, uh, the Mesozoic, okay, there's the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. Oh, there's a nice keel. That's the, uh, oh, there's, I'm sure an ammonite expert could uh, at least get a genus on this because it's so well preserved. Uh, things you would look at to try to determine what genus it is. You see this, that, that kind of spine that running down the, uh, yeah. That's, I believe that's called the keel. So the uh, prominence and placement of that is, is I think a character. And then all the bumps on the, um, uh, that's the exterior. So that's again, shell ornament. So the size and orientation of those bumps. If we could look at another view. Yeah, so keel that's like the keel of a ship or I know even yeah keel as well right yeah. so it help them cut through the water probably I know you said you're not an ammonite scientist so I don't know. <laughs> well 
All right, cutting through the water kind of implies some sort of speed. Yeah. Um, the only living relatives of these guys are the pearly nautilus. And now, now they don't have a, like this guy with the, with the keel, the nautilus doesn't have a, a, a that, that line running down like that. But if you've ever seen, and this is, this is worth doing, going online and finding from, uh, video. Oh yes, yeah. there it is. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So now rotate it 90 degrees, Nick. That's how Yeah, there. Is. Yes, yes. So that's how it was. And, and yes, exactly. <laughs> you do a very good Nautilus. So it's it's worthwhile going online and finding a video of these guys swimming because they are so awkward. They are so clumsy. There's nothing streamlined or, or you know, speedy about it. It's really kind of amusing. So I'm not sure that their Mesozoic uh, relatives were, were any better at that. Now, why did I say Cretaceous? It's because during the Cretaceous, the Gulf Coast was underwater. Texas was underwater for the, you know, this, uh, however many millions of years, the Cretaceous, the KPG. Uh, you know, tens of millions of years, uh, shallow ocean. And um, when you go to Gulf Coast, Texas, or even Dallas, Houston, Austin, uh, you're in Cretaceous age rocks. And these guys are, are, um, are, they are probably as common in the Texas Cretaceous rocks as our horn corals are common in our Devonian rocks of Michigan. Yeah, yeah. And some of these guys got really big. I mean, you can Google it and you can see a picture of like a, an adult uh, sitting on one of these in the field and it's, you know, it's, it's as big as they are. Yeah, so they're very abundant. The, the white-tailed deer of the Cretaceous seas. <laughs> We have a lot of white-tailed deer in Michigan. This People year. getting mad for the the amnites eating there, <laughs> eating, the seeds, eating there, and the fish in their front yards. Um, so, yeah, very nice. Yeah, super cool fossil. Um, and that is the the last one that we have. Uh, I know you showed some fossils that you had, but you also said that you had brought a couple more. I think there's one that you haven't shown yet. Um, if you want to show that off quick, but oh me, yeah. My my fossils. It's another fossil that nobody sent us, but that we we could find pretty easily in Michigan. Oh, okay. How do you want me to do this? Okay, can I just hold it up yeah. to my video? Yeah, and I, I mean, can you see it? So we can uh, we can pop you up a little bit more. There we go. Okay, okay. So so this guy, which we were looking at the horn corals earlier, which was a single individual. This is our Petoskey stone coral, where each one of these holes uh, was the, the apartment, the home of an individual polyp. Most of us in Michigan um, know the Petoskey stone when we find it uh, after it's been rolling around on, on a beach and it's been all smooth. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, Michiganders really have never seen a, a raw, <laughs> a raw Petoskey stone. We, by the time we see them on the beach, they've been, been all nice and rounded. And of course, the Petoskey stone is our state stone. It's not our state fossil, but it's our state stone. And oh, okay, hang on, hang on. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> always fun being in meeting with paleontologists because they just go reach around and then grab rocks and things from all over the place. <sighs> okay I'm back again yeah I, I forgot I, I had these guys home uh, home my home office for for uh, pandemic teaching yeah speaking of our state fossil so this is the molar, one of four molars this animal would have had. And this guy is, is our state fossil. So uh, it's, it's large, this is a single molar. It's the size of my head. So we can tell it was 
a, uh, a very large animal, <laughs> a single molar. And this is a molar from a mastodon. It's, it's a resin reproduction uh, of a molar from a mastodon. So here's our state fossil. Um, and mastodons are, are uh, fairly common in Michigan, which is why it's our state fossil. Um, so yeah, I, I also have the, uh, a reproduction of the molar from the other great fossil elephant. You see how the, the surface is a lot different. It's flat and it's a grinding surface. Again, this is a single molar. And again, it's the size of my head. And this is from the other great elephant, fossil elephant, uh, the mammoths. And uh, we have more mastodons than mammoths in Michigan telling us that the environment was better for these guys than for these guys. <clears throat> mastodons that liked to browse on leaves and twigs and mammoths that uh, were grazers on grasses and uh, needed a lot of open grassland, which we didn't have in Michigan during the Pleistocene. So lots of mastodons, uh, we find their teeth. We find them when, um, when farmers drain a swampy part, a boggy, wet part of their field. Uh, that's, that's when we get calls that, hey, we've, we found some bones. And uh, it's usually one of these guys. Because the, the Ice Age wasn't that long ago geologically. So these are geologically you know, so young compared to our, our Petoskey stone coral. That's you know, hundreds of millions of, of years old. So, so yeah, that's, that's, I have the coolest job in the world because I get to have things like these in my, in my home office. So I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah. All I need is is the green screen that Nick has, so I can have the cool backgrounds. Now. Pop up whatever environments you want to. No, I. Love That's that. right. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you so much for your time, Dr. Brandt. Uh, it was really fantastic, getting some insight into how to identify fossils. Um, we we covered some tips and things for how people can identify fossils on their own. Um, if they do come across a fossil and they don't know what it is, if someone were to find a fossil in the field, um, what what could they do to try and identify that pretty easily? What resources could they use to try and identify those? Sure. Well, of course, we all have the internet at our fingertips, and we have to be careful. You you want to find legitimate sites, and um, I I always start with Wikipedia. I mean. <laughs> Wikipedia, it's vetted, it's edited. Um, but there are lots of organizations uh, like rock and mineral clubs and, and fossil clubs. And uh, if you're really interested in, in learning more about fossils, uh, try to find a club in your area. And even now with, with um, all this remote connecting that we're doing, there is, for example, um, a fossil club in the Cincinnati area. They're called the Dry Dredgers. And I went to their meeting two weeks ago because it, they had their first ever Zoom meeting. So I was able to join this, this fossil club in Cincinnati without having to drive the five hours there. Um, and, and those are fun too, because once, you know, once the pandemic is over, we could have, you know, get togethers. It's, it's nice to, to, you know, share this hobby with, with other interested people. So of course we live in the digital age. I would start with, with the internet and do like an image search. Um, and um, again, if you, if you know where it's from, that helps narrow it down. Um, and then, of course, if you have a natural history museum nearby and they have someone like Nick working for them. Or Dr. Brandt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you shoot them an email. I mean, we, we get emails like this frequently, frequently, and, and we don't mind at all. It might take us a while. If, if we're really busy, it might take us a while to get back to you, but uh, it's, it's, it's what we love to do. Uh, one of the best books that uh, I recommend to people was, was a book I got when, when I was young. It was The Golden Guide to Fossils. Oh, yeah. I think, I think it's still in print. We've got some of them at the museum. And, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there are lots of resources out there. Um, and the thing is, maybe don't get too, don't get too dedicated to one interpretation of what you think you have. Be, be a scientist in your thinking and be open mm -hmm. to other interpretations. Try, try to make observations of what do I see? You know, how would I describe this? Um, and because I mean, a lot of, you know, sometimes we get um, people send us pictures and it's like, oh, I have a fossil brain. Well, okay. F first of all, brains don't fossilize very often. <laughs> so, and if, you know, if you Google fossil brain, you know, you might see that brains don't fossilize. So just keep an open mind. Mm -hmm. um, so to be a good scientist, you got to keep an open mind and be open to um, uh, other people's input, soliciting other people's expertise. Yep. Uh, and another fun thing you might do is draw your fossil. Uh, when students take a paleontology class that I teach, they have to draw a lot because drawing it really forces you to see your fossil. You've got to really see it to draw it. So it's a way to become familiar with, okay, how many bumps? Is it bumpy? What's, what's the surface texture? What's its shape? Yeah. So there's, you know, we, we can make this, let's see, there's STEM, right? Science, engineering, math, technology. We can make it STEAM by adding the arts to it, adding the drawing component. Yeah, and it's such an important part, like you said, for people in classes, but also, I mean, scientists, if you read any scientific publication about, you know, they discovered a new fossil animal, there's always a drawing of sometimes, the, or at least pictures. Yeah, but of exactly. Reason, some sort of art about what the animal looked like when it was alive. And so always drawing and paying attention to those details are the yeah. way make scientific discoveries. So it's really- Exactly. Important. Yeah. Cool. I want to just put in a plug for oh, our poetry thing. I mean, speaking yeah. of steam, I mean, maybe, I mean, especially that, that enigmatic round, dark concretion thing we were looking at, and that might inspire, that might inspire poetry. Yeah. Do so you want to, do you want to? For sure. Yeah. So this is part of a larger, uh, group of talks that we've been doing. Um, so we already did another with Dr. Brandt that was about Michigan geology. Um, we have one with Dr. Mike Gottfried about Arctic fossils. Um, we have some different crafts and different um, talks that we've been doing all throughout this fall. Um, and they're all available on our YouTube channel and on our website. So you can watch them anytime, even if you're not watching this in fall of 2020, you can still go check them out. Um, but so as of today, we have another talk tomorrow about fossil poetry with J. Artemis Hull. Um, and they are a poet that we've worked with on several different occasions. Um, they wrote some great poems about our Hall of Evolution, which are available on our website if you want to read those. Um, but then they are going to be reading some of their poetry and also will be giving some tips about how to write poems of your own, um, specifically about fossils this time, but also those tips will obviously relate to any poetry that you want to write. Um, so if you are watching this uh, today on October 8th of 2020, you can sign up for that tomorrow or you can just check it out whenever you're watching this now. Um, but it should be a really fun talk and we're really excited for it. Yeah, and thank you so much for your time, Dr. Brandt. Uh, we really appreciate all of your expertise and all of your, your wonderful insights about this. It's always so fun to, to identify fossils with you. Um, you have a really big passion for it and you're, you're always really great at explaining things for people. Um, so yeah. My pleasure, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, and thank you to everybody for tuning in and hopefully uh, you'll check out the rest of the talks that we have in this series. Um, other than that, I hope you all have a great fall.